Let us suppose for a moment that the Earth could be made stationary at some point in its orbit around the sun. And for whatever reason, the Earth does not plunge into the sun because of that gravitational attraction. So here's the Earth just chilling. And maybe you've got an extraordinarily bright light bulb, some source of light that emits uh, intensity equally in all directions. So here's this spherical wave front traveling outward from the Earth at the speed of light, C, which we presume to be the same in all directions. Here's that wave front moving away from the surface of the Earth. So I'm showing where the wave front would be at successive points in time. And whether you're standing at the North Pole and watching that wave front recede away from you or standing at the South Pole and doing the same thing or standing somewhere on the equator, you observe the same speed for the, uh, the wave front moving away from the surface, no matter where you are and no matter which direction you're looking in. Okay, now let's uh, try to imagine what that would look like if you were emitting those wave fronts while the Earth is in motion around the sun. So uh, during the time that's passed since this wave front was emitted, the Earth has scooted just a little bit along this elliptical track around the sun. And that means that the center of the Earth is a little closer to this side of the wave front than it is to this side. A moment later, uh, that spherical wave front has expanded even further and the Earth has advanced a little bit more in its progress around the sun. And you'll notice that the, the wave front is still centered on the point from which it was released, which would be the center of the Earth uh, a moment ago. So the Earth continues scooting around the track, but the, the center of this expanding wave front is always at the original location of the Earth. And there's a couple ways to see the following fact. The apparent speed of light away from the surface of the Earth would depend on which side of the planet you're on and which way you're looking. If you're, if you're standing on this side of the Earth and looking to the east, so I've got a little compass rose here, then the distance between the surface and the wave front uh, is decreasing at a lower rate, whereas over on the other side of the Earth, if you're looking to the west, uh, the wave front on that side is definitely moving away more quickly from the surface of the Earth. Or you could just think about the fact that the Earth seems to be catching up, so to speak, with this side of the wave front, but moving away from the other side. So hopefully you can see that if this is the way things worked, then the speed of light uh, in its progress away from the Earth would depend on which direction you were looking in. And the reason for that would be the fact that the Earth is in motion. Now, in motion with respect to what? Really in motion with respect to the sun and the reference frame of the sun. So what's kind of implicit in these, uh, these pictures here is the assumption that the light waves are traveling outward through some medium. What I've drawn here is much like what you would see if you were to drop pebbles repeatedly into the surface of a pond. You would see the ripples travel outwards from the location where the pebble entered the pond. So from the location of the disturbance. And you know, you've, you've thought about this already this semester because previously we talked about electromagnetic waves. We looked at how the wave equation can be uh, derived from a synthesis of Maxwell's equations. So this discussion is somewhat familiar to you already, but is there an ether? Is there an actual medium through which these waves must travel? Because if there were, if there really were uh, a medium and light traveled at a particular speed through that medium, then this effect would be unavoidable because these, these uh, spherical wave fronts would be rippling outwards through the ether. And as the earth moved through the ether, that would give the effect of light traveling at different speeds, depending on which direction you were looking. So let me emphasize the fact that in these slides, uh, I was imagining, well, let me draw your attention to the way it would look if you're looking east. So you're standing on Earth's equator and you're looking to the east and you see that the light appears to be going not so fast because you're trying to catch up with it. So looking east, the light definitely goes slower than it appears to be moving when you look 
to the West. Now, what happens approximately six months later? Because we all know it takes a year for Earth to make one giant uh, circuit around the sun. So fast forward six months. And now we've got the opposite effect. So suppose, let me back up here. Suppose a wave front were emitted uh, just before this slide. And so that wave front expands outward from the point where it was produced while the earth continues to move towards the west. So now somebody on the east side of the earth looking to the east would see the light moving faster away from the earth than it appeared to move away from the opposite side of the earth. So that's the, that's the reverse of what was going on six months earlier. So to summarize, if you've got some extraordinarily bright source of light, and it doesn't have to be visible light, right? It could be strong radio waves, for instance, because those are electromagnetic waves and they, they travel at the same speed. If you send that pulse outwards and then watch its motion away from the earth, so the speed with respect to the earth, when you're looking east, that speed will be greater when the earth is on this side of its orbit than it would be six months earlier. In other words, the, the perceived speed of light or the speed of light with respect to your reference frame, you being a person on the earth, uh, depends on your state of motion through the ether. That's the way it would have to work if there really were a medium through which light traveled. And of course, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that this is not the way it works, but let's take a more careful look at why. And here we are back for the thousandth time this semester in the Falstad ripple tank. This is the Doppler effect one demo. And in order to connect this to the pictures we were just looking at, think of this dot with the red circle here or this square with the red circle as being the sun. And since it's not moving on the screen, that means the, the fixed screen would be the reference frame of the solar system really the reference frame of the sun because everything else in the solar system is moving around the sun. And then you can think of this moving dot or moving source down here as being the earth emitting these spherical wave fronts at regular intervals of time. And this demonstration is really meant to show the behavior of waves that travel through a medium. Again, we've, we've looked at the fact that the Doppler effect, uh, the conventional Doppler effect applies to waves through air sound waves or water, uh, things are different when it comes to light. But let's just suppose, it, you know, let's go back to the 1800s, the, the thinking at the time that there is a medium through which light must travel. We'll call it the ether. And if that were the case, you can see that uh, because of the source's motion, think of that as planet Earth. If you're on planet Earth looking to the left, those wave fronts are not moving away from you as quickly as the wave fronts behind you would be. Yeah, I got that right. So now that this thing is going to switch direction, think of this as like Earth six months later, going in the opposite direction on the other side of its orbit. So if you look to the right, those wave fronts are not moving away from the Earth as quickly as the ones on the other side are. So it would be nice if I had a graphic for this, but think of about being on a boat with a, a pocket full of little rocks and the, you stand at the front of the boat and throw rocks into the water ahead of the boat. And each of those rocks makes a ripple. And because the boat is going forward into the ripples, um, the speed of the ripples past the boat, uh, the ripples that are coming from the front, would be greater than if your boat was just chilling in the water. On the other hand, if you stood at the back of the boat and threw rocks from the back, then the ripples would have to try to catch up to the boat as it was moving. And so those ripples would not seem to approach you as quickly. Okay, so if you didn't follow that, the point is the apparent speed of ripples past the boat, or in this case, past planet Earth, past planet Earth, would depend on uh, the direction and speed of the boat or planet Earth through the medium. That's the whole idea. If light really does travel through a medium, then you could make the speed of light appear to depend on your state of motion through that medium. And of course, you've heard of these guys before. Michelson and Morley decided to investigate whether that effect uh, could be measured, the changing speed of light, depending on which direction Earth was heading, 
through the ether or even which direction you were looking. Remember when uh, planet Earth was moving to the east, the perceived speed of light away from the planet would depend on whether you were looking east or west. So they devised that ingenious experiment, which uh, really doesn't look particularly fancy to our modern eye, does it? I mean, a lot of the PASCO equipment we use at the community college looks more expensive than this stuff, but I'm sure this was state of the art at the time. So they used interferometry, even though they didn't have lasers back then. So they had to use some other means of producing coherent light. But so the, the result of the experiment was null. Within the margin of error, there was no evidence to suggest that the speed of light was any different at one time of the year versus another, or when you're looking east versus west. And most of the details are lost to history now because now we just accept the, the explanation that was eventually proffered by Einstein. And that's, of course, to just do away with the ether altogether. There's no need to, to have any sort of medium. And that really should have been clear by the time that Maxwell synthesized the, the various results from electricity in magnetism into the body of equations that we now call Maxwell's equations. But I guess uh, physicists or the scientific community was a little slow to accept. It took a few more decades after the 1860s um, to really accept that perhaps there was no medium required for light. Uh, there's a recreation of the original apparatus. Maybe some of these parts are actually from the original experiment. That's pretty cool. And this is at Case Western Reserve University. Okay, so here are Maxwell's equations. And you've probably seen them in this form, although not everybody insists on using the double integral signs uh, and the triple integrals. That's a little, a little fancy and unnecessary. But you've seen the integral statement of these laws. For instance, Gauss's law, uh, the flux of the electric field through a closed surface is proportional to the electric charge enclosed within that surface. Well, all of these laws can be expressed in so-called differential form. So these are equivalent. You would use calculus or vector calculus to go from one uh, version of the statement to the other. And you, you'll recall that these two constants here, the permeability of vacuum or free space and the permittivity uh, are experimentally determined constants. They were measured in a laboratory and they have to do with, uh, in the case of the permittivity, the attraction, the electric attraction or repulsion between things like charged pith balls. These are things that were studied in the 1700s and the 1800s. And this one would have to do with the uh, repulsion or attraction between current carrying wires. So experimentally determined constants. And you could do some, some calculus with these equations, throw them in a solvable, mix them together, uh, throw some curl and divergence in there, and out pops the wave equation. We've already talked about this. And in that wave equation is a term which suggests that the speed of light should depend on those experimentally measured constants in this fashion. And of course, that number comes out to be 300 million meters per second. And just to refresh your memory, uh, especially those of you who have taken electricity and magnetism, this law here, or uh, in integral form would be this one, is what we call Faraday's law of induction. Let's not go into any detail. We'll just remind you that it tells you that all you have to do is change the, the magnetic flux through a closed loop and you can get an induced electric field around that loop. Basically, you can make current flow in a wire just by moving a magnet in and out of uh, the surface enclosed by that wire. So don't take my word for it. Let's watch this person demonstrate that phenomenon. So the line integral that you saw in the equation, that would be an integral around any loop uh, encircling the axis of this solenoid here. And then you can imagine those magnetic field lines 
uh, swooping out of the North Pole of the magnet and come back, coming back into the South Pole. And those magnetic field lines would pierce through the surface enclosed by that imaginary loop. So that, that piercing of the field lines through the surface is what we call flux. And the only requirement uh, to get current to flow through those wires is that the flux be changing in time. So because this uh, demonstrator here is moving the magnet in and out of the coil, they're changing the flux in time. And you can see a very small current produced as a result. And you have to ask yourself, does it matter what time of year you do this experiment? Does it matter if you do it in January versus August? Like, does it work in one of those months and not the other? I think you would have heard about that, right? When you took electricity and magnetism, or that would seem to imply that uh, our electric motors and generators uh, only work half the year, uh, or they have to work a different way, six months apart. Um, does it matter which way you face the apparatus? Like, do you really think that if this whole thing was rotated to face north rather than east, it's going to work in some different way? That seems a little far-fetched. This time, instead of an analog current meter, he's got the digital one. Gotta love the music there. Yeah, Faraday's law, magnetic induction. Another result that you may recall is the effect called Ampere's law, which tells us that, oh, laser pointer, wherever there's a current density, for instance, current flowing in a copper wire, there's going to be a magnetic field encircling uh, the axis of that current or the direction of that current, I should say. You know, that, that's a qualitative statement that I've just uttered, but here is a much more precise statement. You could use it, or you could say it with integrals, or you could also state it using uh, derivatives, three-dimensional derivatives from vector calculus, which is what the curl is. It's like a derivative in three dimensions, a type of derivative. Here is a demonstration of that other all important phenomenon of electromagnetism. This individual has a number of compass needles I said a number like I couldn't count to five. Okay, this guy's got five little compasses arranged around a vertical wire. And you can see that that's hooked up to some kind of power source. So he's going to allow current to flow through the wire. Ampere's law tells us that there should be a magnetic field circling around the wire. Now, at the moment, no current is flowing. So each of these needles, you'll notice, uh, well, they're all pointing in the same direction. Not a coincidence, right? They're aligned with Earth's magnetic field. But if the field produced by current through this wire is significantly greater than the Earth's magnetic field, then you can expect the compasses to line up with that field instead. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the current here. I'm gonna turn on the conventional current. And when I do, a force is gonna be exerted upon each individual compass needle, like so. And then if you look at the geometry here carefully, once all of the compass needles settle down, what you will see is that all the compasses here, the compass needles are now tracing out a circle. They're tracing out a circle that is centered on the current carrying wire. Thank you, Captain Kirk. So again, would you really expect this to go any differently if you did it at a different time of year? I don't know when this demonstrator recorded this video, but if he had done it six months later, you would expect the results to be exactly the same. What if you took this experiment up to the International Space Station, which is in free fall around planet Earth? Would you expect the results to be any different? Or if you joined Elon Musk over on Mars, I guess he's not himself going to Mars, especially after he said that a bunch of people are going to die in the process. But if you were one of those crazy people who went to Mars and you took these compasses and the, the power source and the wire with you and did the same thing over there, would you expect that to go any different? Because now you're on a, a planet that's farther from the sun, moving at a different speed, different directions, different times of the Martian year. I think it's pretty clear that, that the results should be the same 
regardless of all of those variables. So at the risk of irritating you, I'll try to drive this point home just a little bit further. When you look up Maxwell's equations on Wikipedia or any physics books, you'll see this or something like this, but what you won't see is little caveats like this. You're not going to see an asterisk next to Maxwell's, excuse me, the Faraday equation that tells you, oh, well, actually this is only true during certain times of the year. And you know, six months later in December or January, uh, the value of these constants would be different. It, you know, the value of these constants has been known for a long time. And I think by now we would have discovered that or discovered the fact, if it were true, that those constants depend on the time of year. I, they're probably being measured repeatedly by, uh, you know, national standards of weights and measures, various regulatory bodies in the scientific world. You know, they probably make repeat measurements of these things, always striving for greater precision. And it probably happens multiple times throughout the year. If those quantities depended on the time of year, I think we would know about it by now. So it would be ridiculous to see something like this. It's just not the way it works. So let me back up. Here's the idea. These equations aren't just true on a particular day of the year or when the earth is moving in a particular direction or when your apparatus is faced a particular direction. They don't depend on any of those variables. They're just true regardless, all the time, any orientation, any direction, any state of motion uh, of the experimental apparatus itself. And the value of these constants don't appear to change. So this tells us that, that there's really no compelling reason why the speed of light should ever be any different. It doesn't matter which direction you're moving, which planet you're on, what time of year it is. Those constants are the same. And Maxwell's equations work in any reference frame. And the wave equation came from Maxwell's equation. So we're forced to the conclusion that the speed of light should really be the same in all reference frames. And actually what we're, what we're discovering here is an even more profound truth, which would be this first one. I like the fact that your book doesn't even bother stating the second one as some all important postulate because it's really subsumed by the first one. The idea is that the laws of physics should not depend on which reference frame you're in. There is no preferred reference frame. You can't say that the sun has some special status because it's at rest at the center of the solar system. Yeah, all the planets move around the sun, but the sun's not at rest either. It's falling towards other nearby stars. And then that cluster of stars is making a giant circuit around the center of the galaxy. And of course the galaxy is falling towards the Andromeda galaxy. So any reference frame you can choose turns out to be not so special after all. And, and that tells us that they really should all be on an equal footing. You can do these experiments with magnets and electricity in any of those inertial frames, and you're going to get the same result. And that would include the speed of light, because remember, uh, the theoretical speed of light comes from Maxwell's equations, which are the laws of physics, or at least a small set of the laws, a subset of the laws of physics. Pretty profound, okay? And Mr. Einstein made that assertion, not when he had the frizzy hair, and well, I guess he had his mustache the whole time, but he made that when he was in his 20s. Such an overachiever. All right, so inertial frames. Let's just look at one little picture to help us visualize those. I've drawn the, the velocity vector for the Earth, which we know is tangent to the orbit. So if you could somehow shut off gravity at this point in time, uh, the Earth would just continue on in a straight line, tangent to the circle at that point, or the ellipse. And so I've drawn a set of axes, three mutually orthogonal axes, you can call them X, Y, Z if you want. And let's just uh, imagine those axes flying off in a straight line. They're not rotating. They're not accelerating. They just do this. That's an inertial frame of reference, which draws attention to the fact that the Earth is really not an inertial frame because, er, let me back up, <clears throat> if these axes were attached to the Earth, let's say the origin was anchored 
to the um, center of the earth. And let's say the x-axis here had to pass through like Singapore, which is near the equator. Well, actually these axes would then be rotating gradually as the earth goes around the sun. And no, they would be rotating once a day. I forgot about the earth's diurnal motion, but also the origin itself would be accelerating because it's moving in a circle. That would not be an inertial frame of reference. So really uh, at any point in time, you can define an inertial frame that is co-moving with the earth. It's moving in that tangent direction. So the earth is really passing from one inertial frame to another very gradually throughout the year. Okay, so we go back to the original pictures here. And if we now accept that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames, and that would include the speed of light because it plops out of Maxwell's equations, well, then what's troubling about this original picture? Why should the person standing on the west side of the earth observe light moving away from the surface more slowly than it appears to move away from the eastern side of the earth? It just, it doesn't work, right? We, it's already been established that that does not happen. So how do we fix this picture? This is really one of the important facets of special relativity is, is fixing our conception of the way light works. What if we try to fix this picture? Uh, if we assume, yeah, let's, let's go with the assumption that the light really does travel away from the earth at the same speed in all directions. Well, if that were true, then doesn't that imply that the light gets here uh, before it gets here? Like this wave front, let's say is, I don't know, 20,000 miles or 20,000 kilometers from the west side of the earth. And this part of the wavefront is like 100,000 kilometers from the surface of the earth. Well, if light travels the same in all directions, then clearly it's going to take more time to get way the heck out here than it would take just to get out here. And that tells us that um, the wavefront being right here, that event, would have to happen before this event, the event of the wavefront reaching this point in space. So wait a minute, because for those of us standing outside the solar system, looking back at the sun, and you know we've observed this spherical wavefront expand outward from that single point, we think that all of these events happen at the same time, like this point on the wavefront reaching this position in space, and this point on the wavefront reaching that position in space, we're assuming that all of those events happen simultaneously because we watched the spherical wavefront being emitted from the Earth's prior position. But we're already forced to conclude that for somebody on the Earth, moving with the Earth, this event would have to happen before this event. So that's not really the purpose of this video. In a moment, we're going to look at the phenomenon of time dilation, but we're already getting hints of the so-called relativity of simultaneity. Two things that are simultaneous to one observer, like a person standing at rest with respect to the sun, watching this wavefront expand outward and watching the earth travel around the sun, those two events would not necessarily be simultaneous to a person moving with the earth. And now, as is customary in a lot of books, we're going to use the classic light clock thought experiment to develop the formula for time dilation. So suppose you're at rest on the surface of a planet far from Earth with no atmosphere, which is why it looks black here. And here comes a rocket ship or a spaceship. This is fun. Here, let me back up and hold down the button here. And we can use this rocket ship to define a reference frame which your book calls S prime. So imagine a set of axes fixed to the rocket ship. The axes don't rotate or tilt and they're moving forward at constant speed in the same direction all the time. You've got your X, Y, and Z axes there. I guess they would be called X prime, Y prime, Z prime. Those are these axes. And then down here, we've got 
an, uh, a reference frame fixed to the surface of the planet, which we consider to be at rest. Of course, you know, there is no absolute rest frame, right? We've talked about that because if you're on another planet, then this planet we're looking at would also be moving. But for now, we'll, we'll assume that the planet is at rest and the rocket ship is in motion. And often these are called the lab frame and the rocket frame respectively. Okay. And here's how the light clock thought experiment works. You have to imagine a pair of mirrors or two, two slabs of material that are reflective. I guess that would be a mirror, right? And a particle of light bouncing back and forth between these mirrors. And these mirrors have a fixed distance between them. And we have to imagine that we're keeping time with this light clock. So as this particle bounces back and forth, let's say it makes a tick every time it strikes a mirror like this. All right, so you're keeping time with the regular clicking that the, the photon makes when it strikes the, the mirror. And of course you could make this more sophisticated. You could imagine a detector that absorbs the photon each time it strikes the mirror and then sends out another one, but we'll just keep it simple and imagine a single particle of light bouncing back and forth. Let's call the distance between the mirrors H. And we are in the reference frame of the rocket now, S prime. So any time interval in this reference frame should include a prime. Now your book often goes with delta Ts and we'll switch back to that in a moment. But for now to keep this simple, I'm just going to use the symbol T prime for the amount of time that passes between clicks. So here's T prime. It's the amount of time that passes between this moment right here and this moment here. So between a and a. Okay, well, we can use the definition of velocity uh, to, to express the speed of light as measured in the rocket frame in terms of the distance that the photon travels between the mirrors and the amount of time that passes. As long as speed is constant, we can say that speed is distance divided by time, of course. And I'm choosing to put an apostrophe next to C because for now, uh, we're going to leave open the possibility that the speed of light might be different in different reference frames. So in, since we're in the reference frame of the rocket, we should call the speed C prime since we're in S prime. And you know, you could choose a system of units that made the speed of light a more convenient number because 300 million meters per second, actually it's a fair, fairly convenient number because it's only got one sig fig there, but it's still a really big number, 186,000 miles per second. That's a clumsy number. Um, you could even define a unit of distance called the meter, which is, no, excuse me, a unit of time called the meter, which is how long it takes light to travel one meter. And if you did that, the speed of light would be one meter of distance per one meter of time, which is super convenient. But let's just do this. Let's pretend we're in an alternate universe where the speed of light is just a different number altogether. So let's suppose that this photon travels three meters from mirror to mirror in a time of one second. Obviously that's vastly slower than the actual speed of light, but it makes, it makes this thought experiment a little easier. So if in the rocket frame, this particle of light travels three meters in a time of one second, then of course the speed would be calculated as three meters per one second. In other words, just three meters per second as seen by somebody in the rocket frame. So let's stick with that uh, in the sequel when we go back and examine what this would look like for somebody standing on the surface of the planet. Let's try to remember that for somebody on the rocket frame in our example, the speed of light is three meters every second. Okay, so now we're back on the surface of the planet watching the rocket go by and let's examine the trajectory of that photon that's bouncing around back and forth between the mirrors. So as the photon rises from one mirror to the next, mirror to the next, the rocket continues forward. And that means, let me rewind, the photon is actually tracing out an oblique path in frame S. That's the frame of somebody standing on the planet. And once it bounces back down to the bottom mirror, it's gonna do an oblique path downward. So really it's tracing out a zigzag path. It's going straight up and down, up and down in frame S prime. Wait a minute, there we go, that's up and down. 
but in frame S, it's doing a zigzag. Okay, so there's, uh, you might imagine a ray, and this is a good time to pause and, and point out that we're thinking about light in a couple different ways here, because earlier in this presentation, I showed spherical wave fronts. Now we're talking about photons, which travel uh, along straight line paths. And then we're talking about rays. So we're, we're taking some liberties here with the nature of light, but all, all of these can be reconciled. Um, I guess the ray is really the path traced out by the photon. And rays would also be perpendicular at all points to the spherical wave fronts. Okay, so since we're looking at uh, or analyzing things from reference frame S, not S prime, the time interval between two subsequent clicks should be called T now. So it's, it's the same two events that we're talking about, a photon bouncing off the bottom mirror and then that same photon bouncing off the top mirror. Those are the two events in question, but the time interval as measured by somebody in reference frame S should be called T. Again, your book might call it delta T for now. Let's just stick with T. And we can also recognize that if the symbol V is the speed of the rocket through frame S, then the distance traveled by the rocket between these two events, or during the time between these two events would be V times T. Right, that's just di uh, distance equals speed times time. So lowercase v is the speed of the rocket as measured by somebody in frame S. And that's this horizontal distance here. You can already see there's a, a triangle that we could look at. And the bottom side of the triangle would have length VT. So let's zoom in here. And let's just suppose, speaking of that triangle, that the rocket is going fast enough so that the three meter vertical distance between the mirrors gets stretched out into this nine meter hypotenuse. That's the oblique path taken by the photon as seen by somebody in the lab frame. So somebody on the rocket sees that the photon just travels straight up by three meters. Somebody on the ground sees it actually travel nine meters obliquely. And what can we do with this triangle? Now you all, you people, meaning you students, Hopefully you've, you've already read most of the chapter on relativity here, special relativity. So at, you already know, you're, you're part of this uh, secret club of people who, who knows that time is relative. You know, now I've, I've got myself wondering what fraction of the population has any notion that that's the case. I don't know, it's probably less than 1%. Um, so you know that, that time does depend on the reference frame, but let's pretend that we're naive. We've had zero exposure to relativity, of course we would assume that any time interval measured by somebody on the rocket would be the same as the time interval measured by somebody on the ground. Like if the person on the rocket had a little TV set and they spent uh, 23 minutes watching an episode of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm or whatever their favorite show is, the person on the ground would have to agree, well, yeah, 23 minutes just passed while that person on the rocket watched an episode of their show. Um, so let, let's not worry about just yet the possibility that, that those two time intervals could be different. And that means that T, the time measured between those two events as seen by somebody on the ground would have to be the same as T prime, which is the time interval measured by a person traveling in the rocket. And we've already assigned a value of one second to that time interval. So now that we know the distance traveled by the photon and the time during which it did that, we can calculate the speed of the light as seen by somebody on the ground. So we do that right here. And instead of C prime, we just call it C because we're talking about a calculation made or an observation really made in uh, the lab frame. So it traveled nine meters in one second. I'm probably going too slow here, right? This is pretty, pretty straightforward. So wait a minute, what's going on here? The person on the ground measures light traveling at nine meters per second, but the person traveling with the rocket observed light traveling at three meters per second. And there, if you assume that the time interval is the same, there's no way around this contradiction because clearly due to the rocket's motion horizontally, 
in the, the lab frame that's as seen by somebody on the planet, uh, this vertical path would have to be stretched out into an oblique path. There's no way around it. I mean, they both agree that the light started out at the bottom mirror and ended up at the top mirror. But for somebody on the ground, because that light clock was traveling forward, that means that the photon had to start out here and end up over here. There's no way around that. Yeah, but Einstein doesn't like that, right? We just spent all that time with the setup arguing that the laws of physics should be the same in all reference frames. You know, this close-up view of the tongue is actually kind of gross. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here. <clears throat> The laws of physics should be the same in all reference frames, inertial reference frames. So it doesn't matter whether you do experiments with magnets and uh, electrostatic attraction on the rocket, or you do it on the surface of the planet, you should get the same results no matter what. If you do an experiment confirming Faraday's law on the rocket, it's going to work just like if you did the same experiment of uh, confirming Faraday's law on the surface of the planet. So all of Maxwell's equations work just the same in both reference frames, and that means you would measure the same values of mu naught and epsilon naught, which means you would predict the same value theoretically for the speed of light. So what's going on here? If both observers in these two reference frames should get the same value for the speed of light, then something's got a crack here. And that's the problem, right? The assumption right there that the denominator of this expression for speed was the same in the two reference frames, that's our mistake. So if we just relax that assumption or get rid of it altogether. Can we fix it? Nine divided by one is not three. Is there something we could do to turn uh, or to change this ratio so that the value is three? That way we could agree. I mean, that's what we want, right? We want, we want the two observers to agree on the speed of light. And again, there's no way around the fact that the distance traveled by uh, light in the space frame is greater. It's not three meters, it's nine meters because you could, you could watch that happening, you could see it. So let's just change the denominator. If we make that one into a three, can we do that? Well, it seems to work. Nine divided by three is in fact three. So that little simple fix right there, changing or allowing for the possibility that the time interval between clicks is different for the two observers allows us to reconcile uh, the difficulty there uh, and make it so that the two observers agree on the speed of light. Oh my gosh. Is, I mean, is this true? Is that really the way it works? We just made up a simple numerical example here, but, but what this very simple thought experiment is telling us is that the time interval as measured by somebody on the ground is greater than the time interval measured by the person on the rocket. So if we go back to the example of the, uh, the person on the rocket watching an episode of their favorite show, uh, if the person on the rocket spent 23 minutes watching an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, then the person on the ground may have observed that to take, I don't know, 40 minutes. What? How is that possible? It really violates our common sense notions of how time flows. I mean, uh, most of you are at least around 19, 20 years old, and you've never seen any evidence in your 20 years that time flows differently for one person than another. Well, we're going to see that the reason you've never noticed it is because you've never approached the speed of light significantly, and nobody you know has ever done so. But if you had a friend or a family member who left planet Earth on a rocket ship at a significant fraction of the speed of light and then came back, you would definitely notice the difference. Okay, that's enough of Kramer here. So I'm going to proceed to do the same thing that's done in your book, but I'll simplify the math just a bit by using trigonometry. In fact, I never see this done with trig in the books, and I don't know why. I think it's because very often this, this lesson is presented so that it's accessible to anybody who knows about Pythagorean theorem. But you all know some trigonometry, so let's make this just a little bit easier on ourselves and look at the right triangle formed by... Uh, the vertical distance between the mirrors, the oblique distance traced out by the photon as seen by somebody on the planet, and then the other side of the triangle here. And we'll use the letter theta to label this angle right here. And we know that the sine function uh, gives us the ratio of the side opposite the angle to the hypotenuse. 
So don't be confused here. H is not hypotenuse. Yeah, maybe I should have chosen a different letter. H is the vertical height between the mirrors. And I'm using letter D for the hypotenuse. H over D would be opposite over hypotenuse. Solve that for D. Just take the, uh, the vertical distance between the mirrors, mirrors and divide by the sine of the angle. Now the sine of an angle is always a number less than or equal to one, right? So in general, you're dividing by a number less than one, which means you're scaling up uh, the number H. That's why D comes out bigger. So the smaller the angle, the smaller the sine of the angle, the larger the oblique distance. Okay, and we've already established the fact that in the rocket frame, which is frame S prime, the speed of light C prime as measured by somebody in the rocket would be the vertical distance traveled by the photon divided by time T prime. Now in the lab frame, somebody standing on the planet, the distance traveled by the photon is that hypotenuse H over sine theta divided by the time, which we're now calling T because we're acknowledging that that time interval may be different measured by somebody in the lab frame versus somebody in the rocket frame. And here's the whole idea. Here's where we go back to the postulates of special relativity. And we say, these two speeds must be the same. It doesn't matter what your state of motion is. You cannot make light appear to speed up or slow down depending on your state of motion. It always zips right past you at speed C, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay, so if we equate these two, of course we get this equation the H's go away. And then let's do this. Let's take this T, put it over here. Take this T prime, put it over here. And the sine theta just goes in the denominator. And we end up with this, which really is a formula quoted in your book. We're already kind of done. That's the formula for time dilation, but we're going to rewrite the denominator in terms of how quickly the rocket is moving over the surface of the planet. But that's it. This is the formula for time dilation. So how do we interpret this? Well, usually when you're setting up problems, think of yourself as being in this reference frame S. So you're watching something or someone move past you. This is the time interval that you measure between two events. This is the time interval that they measure, somebody moving with respect to you. And this angle is the angle that you see here in the diagram. And maybe it's a good place to emphasize now, it doesn't have to be uh, an interval measured by a clock like this. It doesn't have to be a wristwatch or a digital clock or this silly light clock that we're imagining. It doesn't even have to be uh, something like an episode of a show with a fixed duration. It's really, any process that takes time, including aging. If you think about the average, excuse me, the average lifespan of a person, that's determined by the biology of their cells. So in a sense, their biological cells are like clocks and it, it takes a certain amount of time for those things to happen. So uh, I don't know, take a, a cell in your lung. I'm assuming that those cells turn over and get replaced as you go through life. And however long that takes, Let's say it's a year. I have no idea. Maybe a cell in your lung gets replaced every year. Well, that one year in the rocket frame is going to look different to somebody on the ground. Any sort of clock that you can imagine, whether it's electronic or biological or nuclear or mechanical, will tick off time at a rate that depends on the reference frame in which you're observing. Okay, so let's now express the sine of theta in terms of some other parameters here. So let's once again, apply the formula distance equals speed times time. But this time we're looking at the distance traveled along the oblique path. Uh, that's the photon we're talking about as seen by somebody in the lab frame. Well, the time between clicks, remember, is T. And we know that that photon is traveling at speed C as seen by somebody in the lab. So that distance is C times T. And I forgot to point out, your book uses the symbol delta T as the time between clicks on the same mirror. So a round trip time. I'm doing this a little differently. For me, it's just from one mirror to the other. That's T. 
Okay, what happened here? Remember that identity sine squared plus cosine squared equals one? Of course you remember that identity. That's the most important one to remember. If you solve that for sine of theta, you get this. Of course, there should really be a plus or minus out there, but because we're talking about a positive angle here, we'll take the positive root. So we could plop this in there, but before we do that, is there a way to express cosine theta in terms of this triangle here? Yes, of course there is. Cosine theta would be the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. And the adjacent side has length VT, where V is the speed of the rocket. The, the hypotenuse has the length CT. So you plug that stuff in here. This is adjacent over hypotenuse, and then you square the whole thing. Of course, the T's cancel. And what you really have is V over C quantity squared. And I'm going to write that as beta squared. This is pretty universal notation. Your book no, uh, does the same thing. And this is often called light speed, not the speed of light, but light speed. So your light speed is how fast you're going compared to the speed of light. You, you take your speed in whatever system of units you use, whether it's miles per hour, kilometers per hour, meters per second, and you divide that by the speed of light in the same system of units. So when you're driving a car on the freeway at 70 or 75 miles per hour, your light speed is like 0 0.0000002. It's some really small number because you might think that 70 miles per hour is fairly quick compared to like running or walking, but it's insignificant compared to uh, the speed of light. So in everyday life, your beta is a really, 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 really small number. Even for astronauts in the space station, which is falling around the earth at eight kilometers per second, uh, beta is still a very small number. It's probably on the order of a millionth. I guess I could do that in my head, eight kilometers per second, eight times 10 to the third per second, compared to the th uh, three times 10 to the eighth. Yeah, it's something like uh, one hundred thousandth. Okay, moving on. That's it, we're done, right? Because sine of theta is this, which is this. So just plop this into the denominator and there it is. And that formula is so important that I framed it with these beveled edges here. Once again, T prime is the time interval between two events as measured by somebody moving in the rocket. T is the time interval between those same two events as measured by somebody on the ground. And beta is how quickly that person in the rocket is moving with respect to the person on the ground. And of course, it doesn't have to be a rocket, right? You could be standing by the side of the road watching a bus go by. Beta would be the light speed of the bus. T prime would be the time between two events as measured by somebody in the bus. And right here, we see why you never notice this effect in regular everyday life, because for a bus traveling down the highway, beta is, like I said, something like a millionth. It's probably less than a millionth, certainly less than a millionth. A millionth squared is a trillionth. One minus a trillionth is really, really close to one. So T prime divided by the square root of one basically is just um, T prime. In other words, the two time intervals measured by somebody on the ground and somebody in the, in the bus are so close to being the same, unless you have a timepiece that can tell time down to the, to the trillionth of a second or less, you're not gonna notice the difference. How many of us walk around with atomic clocks? Well, I take that back because our cell phones are now connected to um, you know, a radio signal coming out of, I think Boulder, Colorado, among other places, and we're synchronized with atomic clocks, but, but still our, our cell phones don't have a precision of a trillionth of a second. You'd have to pay more money for a clock that could do that. And I'll point out now, for several decades now, clocks have been available that, that can tell time with that sort of precision. So of course, one of the first things an experimental physicist would do would be to take a clock like that onto a, a jet airplane and fly it around the world for a couple of days with a lot of fuel, and then check to see if the two time intervals measured by somebody on the plane and somebody on the ground obeyed this formula. And of course, they did to within the margin of error. So you can read about that. I think that was the Hafael Keating experiment done in the 70s. What's going on here? 
ah, yeah, let's look at the shape of this triangle as a function of the rocket's speed. So I've given this rocket a modest speed. This is the velocity vector here. If the rocket ship were traveling faster than this vertical trajectory seen by somebody on the spaceship would be stretched out into an even more oblique trajectory as seen by somebody on the ground. So now the green arrow is longer, indicating a greater velocity. Okay, so the faster the rocket ship goes, the smaller the angle theta is, and that means the smaller the sine of the angle is. So we're dividing by a smaller and smaller number. So that's a nice visual way to see how the time becomes more and more dilated, so to speak, the faster the rocket goes. The faster that rocket goes, the skinnier this triangle becomes, the smaller the denominator becomes, the greater the dilation effect. Let's now switch up our notation a bit. Previously, the two relevant events were the photon striking the bottom mirror, making a click, and the photon striking the top mirror. And those two events take place in two different positions, no matter which reference frame you're in. Obviously, in the ground frame, one of them happens here, and the other one happens over here. And for somebody on the rocket, even, one of those events happens at the bottom, one happens at the top. And there's a certain disadvantage to that. So let's now do what your book does, which is use the symbol delta tau. So tau looks like the letter T. We're still talking about time here, but it's a very special time interval because it's the interval of time, but between two events that happen at the same location. So let's go with a, a click on the bottom. And then where's what's happening with my slides here? A click on the bottom and then another click at the bottom again. What I could do is make the sound of the clicks different for each mirror, something like this. Okay, so delta tau would be the time interval for the round trip. Click on the bottom mirror and then click again on the bottom mirror. And here's the special name for that type of time interval. It's called the proper time. So in order to call a time interval proper, it must be the time interval between two events that happen in the same location. And that's only going to occur in one preferred reference frame. I'd have to think about that to make be 100% sure that that's true. But I'm 99% sure that there's only going to be one reference frame, one inertial frame, I should say, in which the two events occur at the same place, the same coordinates. Um, and of course, that's not going to be the frame of the ground because as the mirror travels forward, then as seen by somebody in the ground, the second uh, collision of the photon with the bottom mirror happens farther forward. Okay, now there's a subtlety here that I realized as I was contemplating some of our homework problems. So let me point that out now. This rule about how proper time is the time between two events that happen at the same location, you can only use that when both reference frames are inertial. And in this simple example, they are. Somebody on this, the surface of the planet is moving in an inertial reference frame. Let's ignore the fact that the planet's probably orbiting a star, so it's not totally inertial, whatever. And then the rocket itself is moving in an inertial reference frame. If you've read about the twin paradox, uh, the classic twin paradox scenario where there are two twins, one of them gets in the rocket ship, goes away, comes back. Well, then it's actually possible to have two events occur at the same location in both reference frames. Just think about um, the event being, I don't know, the, the traveling twin stepping foot on the ship and then stepping off the ship at the end of the trip. So over here, let's say is the rocket when it leaves the home planet. So the twin that travels steps onto the ship, they fly away from the planet, they come back and then step off the ship. For a, a reference frame, an inertial frame attached to the ship, those two events would happen at the same location, you know, like the, the doorway to the ship, let's say, with the little step in front. But they would also happen at the same place as seen by somebody on the planet. If the launch pad is the same place where the ship returns, so 
that might confuse you. Like, which one is the proper time if the two events, uh, stepping onto the ship and stepping off the ship, happen at the same position in both reference frames? Well, it doesn't work then because the rocket has to go away, slow down, stop, return. In other words, the rocket is being accelerated at key points throughout the trip. So it's not really on inertial frame the whole time. So if both frames really are inertial the whole time, then it's obvious which time is the proper time. Now, for the, the twin paradox example, where one of the reference frames is accelerated, that's the rocket frame, there still is a proper time. And in that case, it's the one that is accelerated. And showing that uh, would require more depth than we see in our book or certainly in this presentation. But if you're curious, just imagine um, you've got a tiny little spacecraft built for one person and you're zipping around the universe, making sharp turns, speeding up, slowing down. You're obviously not in an inertial frame that whole time. You're, you're constantly passing from one co-moving reference frame to another, but the proper time would be the, the time measured by you, the person moving the whole time. But that's, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about that for this simple light clock experiment. So to be clear, the proper time from here on out in the discussion is the time measured by somebody in the rocket ship between this event and this event. Whoops, right here, a round trip time. Okay. And that means we have to redefine the meaning of T or really delta T now. We'll call it a time interval, not to be confused with a space-time interval, which is something presented in the book. And we won't talk about space-time intervals in this presentation. Time interval is just a T final minus T initial. So delta T will now be the time between two subsequent clicks on the bottom mirror. So not this time, but the round trip time. And now this would be the distance traveled by the rocket ship during that time as seen by somebody on the ground. Okay, so we just have to make one tiny change to our formula. Instead of calling it T prime, we're calling it tau. This is the Greek letter tau. Uh, so it's still T and T prime, but now it's T and tau. And we stick that delta symbol in front because really the better way to do things is to assign a time coordinate to all events. So just like X is a particular position on the X axis, T is a, a particular time along the time axis. And that means if you would like to talk about the time that passes between two times, it's really a delta T now. So I was being a little sloppy earlier when I used the letter T for a time interval. A time interval should really be the difference between two time coordinates, hence delta T. Okay, so there's really, and this is a subtle point. There's a couple ways in which you can use the time dilation formula. You've got two time intervals anytime you use the formula, but one of them does not necessarily need to be proper time. So if, if the two relevant uh, events were, let's say somebody in the rocket ship threw a ping pong ball. They threw it here and then it struck the floor of the rocket here. Those two events do not happen at the same position in inertial frame S prime. So the time interval between those two events would not be a proper time in either reference frame. You could still use the time dilation formula. You would just call it delta T and delta T prime in that instance. You can only use delta tau if you're sure that the time interval is a proper time in the rocket frame. So there it is. If you're going to use it in this form with the tau, be cognizant of the fact that that time interval must be a proper time. And if you're wondering where does the word proper come from? Like what, is this the proper time and it's an improper time for somebody on the ground? I think this word comes from a French usage, which really means your own time. So the time measured by you with your own wristwatch as you travel around zigzag through the universe, that's your proper time, your own time. And for somebody else, the time interval would be greater. So that's the other important 
point here is delta tau is as small as it's going to get. That's the shortest possible time interval measured between two events for everybody else. Everybody else for whom the rocket is in motion with respect to their reference frame, the time interval will, will be greater. So delta tau is the shortest possible time interval between two events measured by anybody. Everyone else will find a larger time interval. And you can see that in the formula because the denominator will always be less than one for any light speed greater than zero. Okay, so to, to bring home this point about uh, the dilative effect on time, let's watch Arnold here aging more than somebody that he's watching move past him in a rocket ship. So here's JLo entering the frame on a rocket ship with the significant light speed. So somewhere between zero and one, maybe like a half. And we see as JLo passes through the frame, Arnold is aging noticeably. But the time interval measured by him, I don't know, 40 years, is going to be significantly greater than the time interval measured by JLo. So she doesn't appear to be aging by much at all. Her one year could be 50 years for Arnold. It all depends on the speed of the rocket, the amount of dilation of time. Uh, this ratio, let me go back. This ratio, of course, depends on just how quickly JLo is moving with respect to Arnold. This is too much fun for me. Okay, let's end with one little fun fact or almost end here. This is not presented in your book. Here's a little mental math you can do to quickly get an idea uh, for this, the amount of the time dilation. And by the way, this ratio here, one over the square root of one minus beta squared, that's often given its own symbol or name. It's called gamma, the Greek letter gamma, which I have not written here for you, Greek letter gamma. Okay, remember these Pythagorean triplets? Uh, the lengths of the sides of a right triangle must satisfy this relation. That's what we call Pythagorean theorem. And you can find sets of three integers that satisfy this equation, like three, four, five is one. Uh, hang on a second. Five, 12, 13 is another one. Let's just suppose that you've got three integers satisfying that relationship and that's your light speed beta is numerically equal to the ratio of those two sides. Oh, I just realized this is going to confuse you because you're used to thinking of C as the speed of light. In fact, normally beta would be uh, the speed of the rocket compared to the speed of light. That is not what the letter C means in this context. C is the length of the hypotenuse here. It's that third greatest integer. Maybe this is why your book didn't go over this. So. For instance, uh, I just mentioned three, four, five as a Pythagorean triplet. So three over five or four over five could be your light speed. It's gotta be a number less than or equal to one. If that's the case, then one over the square root of one minus beta squared becomes this. Uh, you plop in beta. This is some integer A divided by an integer C where C would be the integer corresponding to the hypotenuse of a triangle. And in order to do the subtraction here, let's get a common denominator. We can rewrite the number one as C squared over C squared. Now they have the same denominator. And what happens is uh, we've got a numerator now of C squared minus A squared. And that C squared turns into a C because of the square root sign. And it's in the denominator of the denominator. So it really comes up top. And here's where we use Pythagorean theorem. Hypotenuse squared minus side squared would give you the square of the other side length. So this is really B squared under the radical. The square root of B squared is of course B and we're left with this. So you didn't have to follow all that. The, the overall result is very simple. If your light speed is for instance, three over five, then your gamma would be five over four. See how that works? 
you take the hypotenuse and divide it by the length of the other side. The best way to see this is to look at an example. But here's the summary of the way, the way it works. If you have your Pythagorean triplet, A, B, and C, if your light speed is A over C, and again, C is the length of the hypotenuse, not the speed of light, then your uh, time dilation factor is the hypotenuse over the other side. Here's that example. We know that three squared plus four squared is 25, which is five squared. So our A, B, and C are three, four, and five. Suppose that uh, you're going at speed 80% of the speed of light. Yeah, this, this is going to confuse you, isn't it? Here, the letter C actually does mean the speed of light. So if you're going 80% of the speed of light, then your beta is 8 tenths, which is, of course, 4 fifths. Well, those are two of the integers in a Pythagorean triplets. We've already used the four. So the other side length would be three. That tells me that my gamma, the time dilation factor is five over three. See that four fifths, five thirds. And that tells us, for instance, if the twin in the rocket ship travels for 30 years, then the proper time would be 30 years. Well, if you plug that in here, 30 over three is 10, five times 10 is 50. So 30 years for one twin would be 50 for the other. And honestly, that's the only Pythagorean triplet that most of us know, right? I happen to have the other one memorized, 5, 12, 13. There's an infinite number of Pythagorean triplets. So if you happen to recognize one, then you could do this quick mental math and save yourself some number punching on the calculator. Okay, last observation here. At the beginning of this presentation, we looked at those spherical wavefronts and briefly considered the relativity of simultaneity. So instead of thinking now about light as this little packet, this photon that travels along a, a straight line path between two points, let's say that light is emitted by the bottom mirror here. And we'll consider this little spherical wavefront moving out from this point. So the rocket's going to continue forward while the spherical wavefront expands outwards from the original point of emission. So I'll leave the laser pointer there. See how the wavefront is still centered on that point of emission? Same with this one. So from Arnold's perspective, there's nothing funky going on here. Uh, and that's what this, these slides are showing, of course these spherical wavefronts expanding outwards would be, that's what somebody would observe in the reference frame of the planet. But notice the way it would look from JLo's perspective. So JLo is closer at this moment in time to this side of the wavefront than she is to the other side. And that's even more pronounced here. And that's because the rocket is moving to the right. So she's trying to catch up with the right side of the wavefront and she's moving away from the left side of the wavefront. Now, just a moment ago, I said, at this moment in time, she's closer to one wavefront than the other. Well, moment in time as seen by who, or I should say as observed by who. This is only a single moment in time as seen by Arnold who is standing on the surface of the planet. Because remember, the speed of light is the same for all observers, regardless of which direction they're looking or which direction they're moving. So when JLo sees uh, the light emitted from the bottom mirror, it's going to move away from her at the same speed in all directions. So she also should see a spherical wavefront centered on her at any particular moment in her frame of reference. So if she were to freeze time in her frame of reference, there's no way she's going to see this lopsided sphere that's not centered on the mirror. That's not going to happen. Um, so obviously, the wavefront reaching a distance of, I don't know, five meters from the mirror, that's going to happen sooner than the wavefront reaching a distance of 15 meters away from her. And this is what was hinted at at the beginning of the presentation. For Arnold, 
this event, the wavefront reaching this position, happens at the same time as this event over here, which would be this side of the wavefront reaching this position. But those two events cannot be simultaneous in JLo's perspective, because different parts of the wavefront in her frame of reference will have traveled equal distances from her because they tra uh, light travels the same speed in all directions. So this event right here, which is the, the light signal reaching this position on the right side has to happen at a different time than this event over here. Two events simultaneous to Arnold are not simultaneous to JLo. And I'm hoping to, to delve into this a little further in a future presentation, but what you might want to do right now is qualitatively observe the, the spatial relation here. So JLo is traveling to the right with respect to Arnold. And that means Arnold is traveling to the left with respect to JLo. So pretend you're JLo now and that you're at rest in the rocket frame and Arnold is zipping past you in his reference frame to the left. Now there's, there's a set of events that Arnold thinks are simultaneous. This event is simultaneous with this event, but for JLo, the one on the right happens first. Okay, so if you're in that rocket ship looking forward and you're watching this reference frame fly past you in the opposite direction, the events that are farther forward in this picture, farther to the right, actually happen first. And the ones that are uh, behind you, so to speak, they happen later. If you can re remember that qualitative relationship, then it'll help you when trying to work out other uh, seeming contradictions in these relativity problems. And you know, most of your homework doesn't, doesn't deal with these contradictions too much. It's conceptually difficult, but that's how it works. If you're watching a reference frame zip past you, then a set of events which are simultaneous in that reference frame will not be simultaneous in your reference frame. In fact, the forward ones happen before the, the ones in the rear as observed by you. Everybody got that? Good. <laughs>